right, bienvenidos. On behalf of the Wisconsin Hispanic Scholarship Foundation, Mexican Fiesta, we would like to thank you for being part of today's event. We will. Um, <laughs> my name is Mina Rabidou, and I am the two-time Miss Mexican Fiesta Ambassador. I work in the tech industry as a global inclusion and diversity PM, and also serve on several nonprofit boards benefiting youth and educational equity. Today, we will be hosting one of our flagship events, Cesar Chavez, virtually for the first time. On this platform, Zoom, you're able to control your own microphone and video. During virtual events, I wanna remind everyone, it is most appropriate to stay muted unless you are presenting. That way we can have the best audio quality. If you do have a question or comment you'd like to add, please use the chat feature. We would love to hear from you, get your reactions and questions as we go. Today, we are honoring Cesar Chavez's legacy and learning about the impact of his leadership on our community. He became the best known Latino American civil rights activist, leading the struggle for better rights for farm workers. His aggressive but nonviolent tactics made him gain national awareness. Today, we'll also learn about local protagonists of the movement in the state of Wisconsin through their personal experiences. Local activists include Ernesto Chacon, Roberto Hernandez, Jesus Salas, Ramona Villarreal, Francisco Rodriguez, Eva Valenzuela, Maria Cookie Torres, among others. We'll also learn the important role that women had in the movement, such as Dolores Huerta, one of the most prominent women in the movement and the co-founder of the Farm Workers Union. It's very important for Mexican Fiesta that our community and the new generation understand and value the rights and privileges that we enjoy today and our thanks to the determination and commitment of activist leaders who sought to improve the living conditions of the migrant farm workers during that time. Today, we will hear from Jesus Salas, David Giffey, and Dr. Tony Guajardo. First up is David Giffey, an artist, journalist, and photographer who joined the movement and captured the momentum of the movement through his photographic lens that is reflective in his photo exhibition, Struggle for Justice the Migrant Farm Worker Labor Movement in Wisconsin, a chronicle of Wisconsin and Texas. This exhibition opened the opportunity um, and exposed the media to the social inequality and injustices that the migrant farm workers face. So next we will hear straight from David. So please take it away. My name is David Giffey, and I worked with uh, Obreros Unidos in the 1960s and moved to Texas in the 1970s and worked with the Cesar Chavez farm worker labor movement. Uh, and I hope that what I have to say and what I remember about the movement will impress you with my reasons for saying that. The, the staff itself was very diverse of, of different races, including, of course, the, the Chicano, Mexicano uh, people, Jesus Salas and his family, his brothers particularly, uh, were instrumental in organizing Obreros Unidos in Watoma. They moved, they, were, they had been migrant workers for generations in South Texas, in Cristal City. And they moved to permanently to Watoma in 1958. The, the staff was very diverse that Jesus Salas put together. And, and it, the movement, I hope you will remember, did not end in 1970 or 1980 or even in 2020. Because so many of the of the issues that were existent in the 1960s and in the 1970s among farm workers it still continue to exist today, not only among farm workers but among all workers in people and among all classes and races. Professor Chavez came for his first first visit to Wisconsin. And he met with Jesus Salas, and he, 
And, and whenever Cesar came, it was a private meeting at that time, but uh, whenever Cesar Chavez came to Wisconsin, he always spoke on behalf of nonviolence and peace. And, uh, and one of the things that he talked about was the minimum, minimum wage, which was a dollar twenty-five cents per hour, as I mentioned. Um, that same year in 1967, El Teatro Campesino, which was founded by Luis Valdez, uh, a famous movie maker and, and Chicano uh, film maker and playwright uh, who still lives. He's 80 years old now, as I almost am. But he, they, El Teatro Campesino performed for 250 workers primarily at the Park Theater in Watoma. Jesus Salas and I had been out that day working in a farm labor camp. Jesus was organizing and talking to people, trying to get interest in the Oberos Unidos, and people were signing and joining the, the uh, union very frequently. I considered myself a technician because I was a writer and a journalist, and I had some experience with photographs. The dark rooms that I used, and I took thousands of photographs, black and white photographs, of, of the farm workers' movement at the time, um, the dark rooms were bathrooms or conditions that were less than perfect, but I managed, I had the equipment I had and the chemicals, and I could, could uh, produce photographs. So if you have an opportunity to see the photographs that are currently in Milwaukee, I believe, I hope you will read the text block and look at the photographs very carefully. And I will finish by pointing out what, what Cesar Chavez said during that very first time in Wisconsin in 1967. And he, he said the National Labor, among other things, I took notes, but he said the National, quote, the National Labor Relations Act ex excludes farm workers from protection. Look at the farm labor force, as Chavez said. You will find that the majority of them don't happen to be white. There must have been some discrimination when the law was drawn. If agriculture is so sick that you have to depend on slave labor, we will be the first to admit that it doesn't have the right to exist in our business economy. In time, there is going to be a lot of mechanization, but that isn't our immediate problem. There are some jobs that are not fit for human beings, and I'm glad machines are doing them. Unquote. That's, those were the words of Cesar Chavez, and I, I look forward to uh, hearing what the other panelists will say today, and I hope that you will bear in mind that no movement ends. The, the, the farm labor movement did not end in the 1960s. It continues to this day. Thank you very much. What an enlightening presentation, David. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jesus Salas, a key player of the movement right here in Wisconsin. Jesus is a third generation migrant worker who traveled with his family from Crystal City, Texas to the Great Lakes region for 10 years to cultivate and harvest, harvest a wide variety of crops. In 1959, the Salas family relocates to Watoma, Wisconsin. After graduating from Watoma High School in 1961, he attain, attends Oshkosh State College. Beginning in 1966, Jesus works to improve the working and living conditions of migrant workers through Obreros Unidos, United Workers, a farm workers union. In 1968, Jesus joins Cesar Chavez and moves to Milwaukee to organize support for national great boycott. In March, 1969, Jesus becomes the first Latino CEO of United Migrant Opportunity Services, UMOS. While in Milwaukee, Jesus participates in and demands access to UW-Milwaukee that leads to the establishment of a Spanish-speaking outreach institute, now known as the Roberto Hernandez Center. 
Later, he would assist in the development of a Chicano or Latino studies at UW-Madison. Jesus would return to his hometown of Crystal City and assist La Raza Unida political party for the next five years between 1976 and 81. Thereafter, he returns to Wisconsin and obtains his master's of political science in 1985 at UW-Madison. He teaches part-time at the Madison Aerial Technical College in Madison and later moves to Milwaukee and begins a 20-year teaching career at the Milwaukee Area Technical College. Jesus would later be invited to lecture at UW-Madison in Chicano Studies for three years, and he was teaching Latino Studies at UW-Milwaukee. It is in early 2003 when Governor Doyle appoints him to the UW Systems Board of Regents, where he served for nearly five years. Presently, Jesus is retired and has volunteered for Voces de la Frontera, an immigrant rights organization. He has served as a board member in Voces C4 board, co-chaired UWM's Roberto Hernandez Center, 40th celebration, and has assisted in university fundraising for Latino students. Next, I'll hand it over to Jesus. Just need one quick second. We're having some technical difficulties on the presentation end. Give me one moment. Okay, not a problem. And we can't really hear you, just so you know. Jesus will be leading us through a presentation he prepared just for us. As Nina said, uh, I'm a third generation migrant worker. My grandfather shows my uh, father how to get to Wisconsin. My father uh, gets here uh, in the early 1940s. Uh, you see my mom and dad here. They first came here in the, in the 1940s. My second oldest brother was born here in 1942. The war intervenes and, uh, and we uh, go back to uh, Crystal City, Texas by the Texas borderlands but we joined the migrant stream again in the early 50s. You see my brothers and I at the time that we uh, uh, began the 10 year uh, track as, uh, as, migrant, uh, as migrant workers. You, uh, right after uh, I uh, attended three different high schools, uh, uh, we were migrant workers wherever we went. My uh, father would always place us in school and uh, 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 I attended uh, Crystal City High School, Henry Illinois uh, uh, High School and Watoma High School. And we finally relocated in Watoma and uh, uh, went uh, and attended uh, uh, college at Oscosh State College, now the University of Wisconsin at Oscosh, where I met my friend David uh, Giffey. And in the summers, I worked in the first daycare centers for migrant workers. And uh, as you can see here, we're lining up the, uh, the children to get into their, uh, into their programs. And I worked there from 1962 to 1965. By the way, the activities that we undertook in these early years actually got UMAS funded. UMAS got funded in 1965, and now we had federal monies for, uh, for, daycare, uh, for daycare programs. Uh, uh, when I went back to the uh, uh, recruiting children for the daycare for the daycare programs, the uh, the uh, I found uh, a different view of uh, migrancy, or that is, the family started telling me out about the working conditions, about the poor pays, the miserable working conditions, lack of sanitary facilities, and that. And I I was reading a newspaper. I was in Madison at the time, and uh, it said that Cesar Chavez was marching. Uh, from uh, Delano, California to, uh, to uh, uh, Sacramento to protest uh, uh, the working conditions for the grape growers. And uh, I called them up. At that time, you could actually call and ask for a person to person and they found him. And I said, I want to do what, to, what you're doing, uh, Cesar. I want to march to protest the, uh, the uh, working conditions of migrants here in Wisconsin. Can we use your banner? So there's a facsimile of the National Farm Workers Association banner in the background. You see, there's Father Garrigan. He, we got some uh, some uh, uh, symbols of the uh, Virgin Guadalupe, and we uh, set out to march uh, 80 miles in protest of the migrant working conditions. That fall, uh, nearby the uh, the uh, potato processing plant, uh, James Burnt. Uh, processing plant, uh, the workers came up to me and told me about the inequities there. 
And uh, I uh, had not been doing anything all summer. Uh, if I was going to do anything about organizing, it had to be nearby because I was broke, hadn't worked. And uh, so we started organizing uh, the potato processing workers at uh, Elmo, Wisconsin. James Burns, the owner of the potato processing plant, got wind of what we were doing. And he fired all the, uh, all the workers that were members of the union. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, most of the potato processing workers were housed in his uh, labor camp. And so he threw about 30 families out and uh, we got an attorney and uh, the Portage County Sheriff saved the day. And he said, no, you can't, uh, you can't dispossess these individuals. You can't throw them out. They paid their rent for about 30, for, uh, well, there were 30 days, but it were three weeks remaining. So the strike lasted uh, the three weeks that was remaining uh, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, pay. I called Cesar Chavez, by the way, Cesar Chavez had sent an observer to the march and he says, hey, Jesus, uh, this is the same year, this is 66. I'm going down to Northwestern University. We're organizing a clinic and I'm gonna be talking to some doctors and nurses that we're recruiting. Can you meet me down there? So we drive uh, 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 down there and this is a picture of, uh, of Cesar and I in the fall of 66. Uh, and uh, he asked me at that time if, uh, if, uh, if I would support the grape uh, uh, boycott, I said that I would, and I invited him uh, to come the following year. Now, a lot of individuals give credit to Cesar Chavez's work for the community services organization and the work that he and Dolores Huerta undertook at that, uh, at that time. But he was also, what I, what I was most impressed about was his background as a mutualista, or that is, as a member of a mutual aid society, because our parents in Crystal City, Texas, had formed uh, Una Unión Benefica, or that is, uh, 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 a, uh, a, uh, a mutual aid uh, society. And that was uh, the basis for the, uh, for the organization that we set. First thing we needed was lawyers. Uh, because of the uh, large problems that we uh, had in enforcement of minimum wage, of uh, 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 housing conditions, uh, people getting injured, etc. And here we have Alan Sampson uh, standing and we're swearing in, swearing in a number of farm workers in the background here raising the hand is Michael McCann. He was a volunteer lawyer for the, uh, for the, uh, for the union and later became a district attorney for the county of Milwaukee. We couldn't get into the labor camps because we didn't want to imperil the uh, families there. When all the girls knew who I was, we had been living in Wyoming now for a couple of years. And of course they knew that I was organizing the union the previous year, we had been marching. So that was known to everyone. So we used to organize baseball games. And that way uh, uh, we'd be uh, getting all the uh, families out there. You can see the cars of families extended uh, just by the hundreds. There was nothing to do after you got done uh, harvesting cucumbers. So this was a great, uh, a great uh, uh, recreational uh, uh, facilities uh, that we provided for the workers and the union members. Chavez called me up and he said, hey, uh, Teatro Campesino is, uh, is on a tour. They're on the way out east, they're raising funds for the, uh, for the union. Uh, can you uh, uh, provide a venue for them to raise funds? And I said, well, I can. I think a great place would be at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I said, but will they uh, do a fundraiser for us, uh, for the farm workers in central Wisconsin and not charge us anything? So here, Luis Valdez in the background with a Mexican hat on uh, 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 is, uh, is, in the, uh, is in the image here, performing for migrant workers primarily. You should have seen the kids after the, uh, after the skits. They would be performing skits all over the labor camps. Nobody wanted to be a grower. Everybody wanted to be a, a farm worker. The other thing that we did going along with the mutual aid society and providing services was create a, uh, a health clinic. I talked to the University of Wisconsin physicians and we got volunteer physicians to come on the weekend and we opened up the first uh, 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 clinic. That year in 67, we had a walkout. Now, we didn't want to strike because I didn't want the same thing to happen to us in James Burns, that we would go out and stay out. The cucumbers, uh, uh, there were over 700 workers working for uh, ladies and uh, we'd have a walkout. I didn't want to imperil their job. I didn't know what we're going to do if, uh, if all these individuals lost their job. So we'd have a walkout. We're going to have a walkout to show Libby, we know Libby that uh, we represent their workers, but they're going to go back to work the following day. Well, uh, 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 we petitioned the Wisconsin Employment Relations Commission. By the way, Wisconsin provided protection for farm workers. The California 
uh, 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 there was no California statues. That's why Chavez had to go to a great boycott to get the uh, the uh, the the uh, growers to uh, compel them to negotiate with the uh, with the grape uh, strikers. Here in Wisconsin, uh, we had the uh, labor law and we won the election, but Libby decided to move. Uh, their operations out of state rather than negotiate with the union. And so we started organizing their processing plants. Here's one of them. We organized three of them uh, uh, that year. This one is in Hartford, uh, Wisconsin. Here's Pancho Rodriguez, who would later follow us to uh, Milwaukee uh, and later lived in Madison, a tremendous individual. He ran the Gasolinera Cooperativa, again, following on the whole mutualista, uh, mutualista notion, you provide services. That's what organizations are for, and, uh, and uh, you can see the price of gasoline there on the side of 31 cents. Uh, Eva Valenzuela on the left side of your uh, screen there, uh, got fired for, uh, for wearing the union button. Uh, uh, no mercy from, uh, no, no, uh, no respect for the rights of the individual workers. Uh, she was wearing the union button while she was harvesting uh, cucumbers. She and her whole family were fired. So we, we decided to put up a tent city and we send the word out, any grower that fires families, we're just going to fill the whole downtown of Watoma with tents and families. And of course, at that time, uh, Watoma is a tourist uh, uh, a city and it's got anyone in Mexicans to be living downtown in the park. So Eva was the only family there. Here she is uh, speaking to the uh, 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 families. You can see on the right hand side. Uh, uh, the workforce, and here's where the Lotus weather is so important. The workforce at that time was primarily families, and you see women and children, and that's why it's inconceivable to me. We celebrate uh, Cesar Chavez, and, and we have to recognize the women organizers. In this case, Eva Valenzuela, Maria Cookie Torres, and of course, with Cesar, is the Lotus Huerta. Chavez told me, Jesus, you know, this, you've been at it three years and you haven't gotten a contract. Help me organize a great boycott, and once we win, in uh, California, we'll help you win here in Wisconsin. Who was, who was to know that it's gonna take us five years to win? So here I am, come to Milwaukee to organize a great boycott. And while we're here, uh, Father Maurice, as you can see in the picture, uh, uh, lets us uh, have a little office space at 524 West National. And here he's talking to the parishioners about uh, support for the uh, great boycott. The, uh, uh, the NAACP Youth Council had been marching 200 days. Uh, for an open house uh, uh, ordinance. And so the farm workers movement and the NAACP Youth Council intersect. Not very much is spoken about this intersection, but it was very important because we adapted their direct action activities and you're gonna see some of them. Here, Grappi is visiting the uh, picket line at Cold Footer on Capitol Avenue. While we're here, the farm workers are uh, following me to Milwaukee and they want to, uh, they want to, uh, 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 their displaced, and <laughs> we have to see how we can help them. The administration at Yumas at the time said, well, we don't want to get involved. Jesus, uh, if we get involved, we're going to be, uh, we're going to lose our grant. So make a long story short, Yumas at that time had no migrant or former migrants in their board as per the Office of Economic Opportunity Guidelines. And none of the administrators were, were Latinos or primarily Mexican-Americans who they serve. So uh, 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 to make a long story short, we took over the agency. Uh, 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 and here I am, uh, we are reorganizing the uh, United Migrant Opportunity Services from strictly a daycare program, as I told you, had gotten funded for in 1965, to, uh, to uh, uh, an adult basic education with employment and training, and of course, advocating on behalf of, uh, of, uh, of uh, farm workers. And just like Cesar Chavez, you remember that iconic picture of uh, that evening that uh, Robert Kennedy got shot in 1968. The farm worker wasn't just exclusively about wages and working conditions. Dolores Huerta continued to work, uh, 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 getting the vote out and, and register. And this is what we continue to do, just as Chavez had done in, uh, in uh, 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 California. Here, Dante Navarro becomes the first candidate for, uh, for uh, uh, the Wisconsin Assembly. Chavez again visits uh, the state of Wisconsin. He's just fascinated with all the work that we're doing. Wisconsin is crucial for the, uh, for the grape uh, 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 boycott. Why? We consume at per capita at that time more brandy than any other state in the union, in addition to all the grapes that we consume. So Chavez is here and he's taking pictures. You can see 
uh, 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 wherever he went, uh, he took pictures. Here's some of that intersection that I was telling you about between the African-American community and, uh, and the farm workers uh, from left to right in the bottom picture, Orville Pitts, Milwaukee County Supervisor with the great boycott button, Val Phillips, the first woman uh, alder person, and to her right, uh, Lloyd Barbie. Now, Lloyd Barbie is important because he's got a lawsuit to desegregate the schools. We dovetail on that activity. Again, not something that's very uh, uh, much pub publicized. And here, Chaco and the Latin American Union for Civil Rights and Roberto Hernandez are petitioning the Milwaukee public school system, we're part of the desegregation lawsuit, to uh, uh, celebrate Fiesta Patrias, to institute a bilingual uh, program, to hire Latinos. And when they don't uh, want to cooperate by, uh, by recognizing the Fiestas Patrias, we you see just uh, hundreds of, uh, of the children, we uh, uh, conduct those walkouts. Again, the, uh, the, one of the, one of the uh, most uh, dramatic scenes and most dangerous where the, uh, where the uh, welfare cuts, the uh, racist uh, Wisconsin legislature uh, 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 were dismantling the uh, safety net uh, for indigent families uh, claiming that uh, African-Americans were moving uh, to Wisconsin uh, and Mexicans were moving from the Texas borderlands to Wisconsin to enjoy higher benefit, welfare benefits. It was just a racist lie. And so we march, uh, Welfare Mothers March, uh, from uh, 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 Milwaukee to Madison and uh, uh, to testify before the, uh, before the uh, uh, Wisconsin legislature. We had a sit-in and they called the National Guard to get us out. Uh, while demonstrating in Milwaukee uh, for the same reason for the dismantling of, uh, of, the, uh, of the welfare uh, programs, Ernesto Chacon and, and Jose Puente are arrested quickly sentenced to jail for six months and we start uh, uh, having demonstrations to free them. And here we have over 500 individuals protesting and demanding a pardon uh, from Governor Lucy. And by the way, we garnered uh, a pardon in March of 1971 and Chacon never has to go to jail. The biggest uh, battles that we faced was uh, the university system. Here, uh, when I enrolled in, uh, in 1968, uh, 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 the, out of 25,000 students, all the Latinos could sit around one table uh, uh, at UWM. So we start picketing and again, doing a little bit of uh, direct action that we had learned from Grappi and the Youth Council. We had night vigils, we uh, were camping out overnight, we had a fast and we finally, uh, uh, five of us went to jail, uh, uh, including uh, Dante Navarro, Goyo, uh, and uh, Marla Anderson and, uh, and uh, here uh, we take over Chapman Hall and finally the establishment of the uh, Spanish speaking outreach institute. I had only uh, uh, said that I was going to stay at UMAS for a couple of funding until the uh, agency got stabilized. I enrolled at UWM and the same thing uh, uh, as in UW Milwaukee. Uh, but here what we concentrated on was academic programs. And this took 10 years, by the way, to establish Chicano studies. And here's, uh, here we are negotiating. Uh, we were, uh, I'm at the center there with a hat on. Uh, 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 Saldana is uh, speaking, later attorney to his right, uh, Emmett Sevilla, later professor, University of Texas. We're all members of the advisory committee we recommend a Chicano studies uh, department. The dean wouldn't, uh, wouldn't uh, agree because he said that he needed the funds. So we went to the University of Wisconsin and we amended something unheard of. We amended the University of Wisconsin budget, including $50,000 for Chicano studies. And uh, while we're at it, uh, we continue legislative initiatives. We were the only group uh, at Madison uh, uh, that could lobby effectively. It, uh, we supported uh, uh, UMAS's initiative to create a migrant labor law with the help of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, Nes Flores and, uh, and uh, John Abbott from uh, 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 law, from the legal aid of Wisconsin. We uh, set up the uh, migrant labor law and the bilingual program during that time. And then UMAS and, uh, and Mecha set up the migrant tuition bill which was in-state tuition for migrant uh, workers. And we did this without a single Latino representative in the whole state uh, legislature in the assembly or in the uh, Senate. Okay. That concludes my, uh, my presentation. If there's any questions or comments, I appreciate it.
Thank you, Asus, for sharing your incredible story with us. Thank you, Nina. Thank you for your introduction. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Antonio Guajardo. Dr. Guajardo will help us understand the importance and significance of community organizations like the Wisconsin Hispanic Scholarship Foundation and during and after the movement. Um, a little bit about him. He has a PhD in urban studies from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He's the author of The Milwaukee Police and Latino Community Relations from 1964 to 2000. He's a former campus director and assistant dean of Springfield College Milwaukee campus, director of the National Business Education Council, Wisconsin Hispanic, Hispanic Scholarship Foundation, former president and board of directors. Over to you. My name is Tony Guajardo. I'm here to talk to you about the importance of Mexican Fiesta as a continuation of the uh, civil rights movements for Latinos in Milwaukee. My background, I was in law enforcement for 26 years, retired. Uh, I got my, had my PhD from uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in Urban Studies. I uh, headed a, a program for criminal justice in one, for one college, and I was a director for another college in Milwaukee. I was a national college. It's in this vein that I want to talk about Mexican Fiesta. I pu recently published a book on the relationship or the community relations between the Milwaukee police and the Latino community from 1964 to 2000. It was in this, doing my research, that really got into the importance of Mexican Fiesta as far as the continuation of the civil rights movement for Latinos in Wisconsin. I happened, I interviewed, one of the people I interviewed was Ernesto Chacon. Ernesto Chacon, along with Jesus Salas, was active in the uh, civil rights movement for Latinos in Wisconsin and in Milwaukee during this period in the middle 60s. One thing that stuck out, Ernesto said, we passed laws but needed people to enforce those laws. They were building structure. The, uh, the, the movement was very well planned. As a result, how does Fiesta fit in? Well, Fiesta is important for two things. As we all know, Mexican Americans have been coming to, Wisconsin, to the U.S since the inception of the country. As a result, there's a, the uh, Mexican Americans, for, Mexicans formed a, sub, a subculture, the Chicano group, as you might call it, the Tejanos, people from California. Milwaukee had their own Mexican community in the 1920s. And then in the 19, mid 60s, it was the Tejanos or Chicanos that really led the, uh, the movement for the farm workers, uh, for their rights, for their health. And uh, they, they uh, they built social organizations like UMO, Spanish Center, along with other Latinos. What Mexican Fiesta does, it fuses both the subculture with the original culture. What do I mean? Okay, I see Mexican Fiesta as a handoff from that uh, original uh, Latino movement of the 60s. They're providing scholarships for, uh, for Latino students to continue a college education. What does that do? That helps reinforce infrastructure. Uh, the scholarships, the students are become lawyers, they become business leaders, they become politicians, and they take care of that. They make sure that the Latino interest is being taken care of. We also reinforce culture. As I said before, Mexican-Americans and Mexicans, they're two little, they're same people, but two different uh, subcultures. The music, the food, uh, a little bit of the history is different. What Fiesta does is it brings them both together. It brings in the uh, subculture, which is the Chicano culture, and combines it with the Mexican culture. It also reinforces volunteerism and helps develop leadership. The leadership is developed by bringing people back into the community. It's not, not unheard of that once a person becomes successful, they leave their community. What the Fiesta does, it brings these people, these college graduates that, be, that become successful back into the community as volunteers. Fiesta becomes a hub and exchange of ideas. The original Fiesta or the original Latino movement was built out of uh, liberal ideas, liberalism. But it's not a secret that Latinos, we come out in all different stripes. We're liberal, conservative. We are religious, not religious. 
What Fiesta does is brings everybody together through volunteering, working together side by side. We exchange ideas, we talk about the community, we talk about the importance of maintaining the, the identity, the family values. Uh, the uh, movement, Latino Civil Rights Movement, was, was built on family values, and the fiesta continues the, the, the family values. If you look at the festival, you see kids running around with their parents, the volunteers have their parents. Fiesta has a history of producing their volunteers. A lot, when I first started, a lot of the uh, the little kids running around are now, some are board members, some are out there volunteering as committee members. The other thing too that it does is it brings our history to life. We serve in the military, our veterans, if you look at our culture tent, there's history there. Our veterans are highlighted, we paid the price for membership in the society. We also look at where we come from. Uh, families that have been in Wisconsin for a long time can come back and explore their roots and again reinforces the value of who we are. So Fiesta is an important part, it's the handoff. The 60s were important because it built the social organizations, it built, helped build the structure. Now it's up to us through Fiesta to maintain the festival and the tradition to build on that. And that's what Fiesta does. It builds on what was started in the 1960s. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. Now Jesus is gonna take some audience questions. So does anyone have a question? You can put it in the chat. We also have plenty of time. So if anyone would just like to come off of mute and ask a question. Jesus, hi. This is uh, Arturo. Arturo. I just, I just kind of wanted to, you know, I, first of all, I enjoyed your, the, you know, what you presented. You know, gave a real good historical background of uh, our past and our cultural. But from, from, just wanted to, to hear from you. How did you uh, see Chavez in terms of a person in? his dedication in working with the betterment of the farm workers? Well, the, uh, the, uh, as, as I told you, I met him right, right off the bat at 66. And then I invited him uh, and he came to Milwaukee in 67. He came again in 68. I went to Delano and uh, uh, he hosted me. I, he assigned me to a particular family that, that I stayed with. So I spent a lot of time with him. There's a particular moment. We were flying back to Washington, D.C., and we're in the airplane, and we encounter some turbulence. And uh, he, he, uh, I, I just hang on to, the, to my seat, and he starts praying to himself. So he, he, he always gave me the impression that of, his, of his deep religious that sense of religion that he had, that uh, that is very real, that uh, comes out in the uh, when he's concerned about the violence that is going on in the fields, uh, farm workers being attacked and even killed. He goes on a fast. Uh, when he first marches, he calls it a peregrinación. So you know that is the first impression that I had. The other impression that I, I uh, 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 you know. We always think uh, of leaders, you know, having this great ability to be able to impress individuals, uh, uh, great orators and that. That's not Cesar Chavez. Cesar Chavez was, was really very soft-spoken. Uh, uh, bien delgadita que tenía la voz. And, uh, and uh, you always, you, you, everybody had to be really quiet when he, uh, when he spoke, because he was, uh, was soft-spoken, but he was tremendous, and people enjoyed uh, uh, hearing him, and I think that, you know, his honesty came through. Now, that doesn't mean that we never had any difference of opinion. Uh, uh, after the third year of organizing, he wanted me to spend more time uh, 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 helping him with a great boycott and less time on the politics here in Milwaukee. And, uh, and uh, I was committed to some of the events that, that you saw uh, uh, that uh, I got involved with, with, uh, with humus and with the uh, politics, et cetera. I uh, uh, started going down back to Texas to organize uh, 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 the farm workers. So you can't organize 700 workers in one, uh, 
in uh, the eight week period of time on Harvard to Hillcomers. So I used to spend a lot of Texas. I got involved in the politics down there. Giffy, as he mentioned, went down there and got involved with Oden Dine. And my brother Manuel also, it was a transnational movement. Uh, I getting involved with the political revolt in Crystal City, Manuel and Giffy with Oden Dine. And we had a different view of Oden Dine. Uh, 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 thought of a union of, uh, of the undocumented and the, uh, the documented or the, the Tejanos on this side. Uh, Chavez, uh, Chavez didn't agree with that because in uh, California, the growers were using uh, the undocumented to break strikes. And so he wanted that border protected. So yes, there were differences of opinion. Uh, 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 my respect for him, his uh, notion of his peacefulness, his religiosity, all of that was very honest and I admire him for it. But we had difference of opinion. We had difference of opinion in terms of what I saw as was needed in my involvement here in the politics and social service programs and, uh, and the way we saw the union. I saw the union as representing both uh, farm workers from both sides of the border. And he was having problems because the growers were bringing in the undocumented from the other uh, side of the border. Hey, Susa, I also heard, and I don't know if you can confirm, that when Cesar Chavez visited locations. He rarely stayed at hotels. He wanted instead to stay with families. Is, you know, what, what significance did that have? And what message was he conveying by doing that? He wanted to get to know us. Remember that picture that I showed you with that camera? Uh, he wanted to know when he spent, uh, he spent a couple of days here uh, uh, with us. By the way, Dolores Huerta was the same. Dolores Huerta actually stayed with Ernesto Chacon and, and Lutezia when, uh, when she came up here and just thoroughly enjoyed it. I think the last time she came when we, uh, we marched from Voces de la Frontera to the municipal building downtown, uh, 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 she, uh, she was looking for Chacon. Chacon at that time, of course, as you know, was uh, busy taking care of Lutezia, so she wasn't available. Pero él también, the same thing. And I think that there was, because there was so much movement uh, 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 with the boycott. The boycott was in so many different communities. And uh, they began the organization with so few resources that they never expected to stay in hotels. And the way they got to know us was we're staying uh, 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 in individual families. Now, remember, Arturo, when we started the Mexican Fiesta, we didn't have any money for hotels for the performers. Do you remember how we stayed, the performers stayed in La Margarita? They stayed in, in our home over on, uh, on 21st Street. It was the same thing with the early days of the, uh, of the farm workers. And, and Chavez never outgrew that. Siempre quería quedarse con familias. Thank you. We have another question. What kind of challenges did you face while organizing? And what's your advice for young activists? The, uh, the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges that we had in organizing was that we had to organize in labor camps. Or that is, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't actually have a direct access to the families. You saw, as I mentioned, that we used baseball games, uh, softball games, in order to get the crowds together. Uh, I had some real good relationships with the, uh, with the priest, uh, Father Garrigan was in the first day of the march, as you saw there. So he would allow me to leaflet. Uh, uh, the church uh, was very well attended by most of the uh, 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 Chicanos and Me uh, Mexicanos uh, who were mostly Catholic. And, uh, and uh, so he would let me uh, leaflet the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cars there. Uh, uh, there was a softball diamond uh, right, uh, right uh, in the uh, church grounds. He would allow me to, um, to use that to have recreational games for youth. That uh, 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 clinic that we started with the, uh, 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 with the physicians from the University of Wisconsin, that was Catholic Church property. So before I even got to Milwaukee, the whole idea of organizing a union was setting up coalitions. And the, uh, the church groups, the religious groups, the uh, uh, former uh, 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 union members that were retired that were supporting us in the, uh, in the fields were all crucial. And those were the ideas that I got when I came here to, uh, to, uh, to Milwaukee. And then I mentioned the, the most decisive thing, the whole notion, you're gonna build an organization, it has to be a deuce pay. And, see, and Cesar would say, if the farm workers want uh, 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 an organization, they're gonna have to pay for it. There, it has to be a membership organization. And if it's a membership organization, it's a deuce pain. And this is a whole notion of mutualismo. 
And so I, when I came here to, uh, to, uh, to Milwaukee, we carried those notions of social services. Uh, uh, Father Maurice resigns and, and Carlos Sevilla assumes the directorship of, uh, of El Centro Hispano. We got money for employment and training and SEP was created. We got another Latino. Chacon was a genius. He, 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 he thought, hey, this whole thing about Chicanismo that we're projecting is fine for us, but Milwaukee is a much more diverse community than the migrant workers. And his idea was that it was going to be a Latin American union. And the way we incorporated the Puerto Rican community, the diversity of the Latino community. Again, the biggest fight that we had was a university, which was multi-year effort. What was the organization? It wasn't Yumas, it wasn't uh, El Centro, it was CELA. It was an organization of organizations. It was a concilio educacional the the organizaciones latinoamericanas and that was what was uh it, it took us a long time but that was the basis for our success that you have to organize the community and those uh, the, the foundation has to be broad based from the beginning uh, otherwise you're not going to uh, uh, be successful or you know, enjoy only limited success in my estimation thank you we have another question did you ever have a situation where you had an inter an altercation with police or you were put behind bars for peaceful protesting? What advice can you give to activists and how to handle that? The, uh, the, uh, the first three and a half years in central Wisconsin, even though we had uh, problems and confrontations with, uh, with police, I had never been arrested. But as I mentioned earlier, we came here uh, at the end of, uh, of, uh, of the 200 days of the NAACP Youth Council marches, they had already rioted, people had been killed, buildings had been burned. So the police treated us the same as they treated the uh, young African-Americans from across the uh, city. I had never been arrested in my life during all these years, had been organizing. When I got to Milwaukee, I couldn't stay out of jail. We got arrested at Cold Food Store. Uh, we got arrested at the uh, at the, uh, at UWM. We got arrested crossing the street at uh, at uh, at uh, 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 from Chacon's uh, uh, office. We got arrested uh, protesting Chacon's uh, 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 jailing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the biggest problem was the violence. This riot, this riot, uh, uh, police uh, 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 cladded with their billy clubs. Uh, uh, were the most vicious thing that I ever seen because any any time that you got hit with one of those clubs, it was you know you'd be knocked uh, uh, senseless. So that was the biggest danger, and it wasn't so much that I was afraid that I was going to get hurt. I had a, I was an experienced uh, uh, individual. I knew I knew <laughs> I know how to duck. But uh, some of the younger folks that were marching, they had never confronted, you know, a policía con fuego en las manos. Uh, uh, I was worried about them, always. Always. And women, que no tenían experiencia, uh, vulnerable. Uh. I really appreciate your, your candid responses, Jesus. We have another question. What are the lessons learned from historical civil rights movement that we can apply today? Well, the, uh, the, I ended up my talk with, uh, uh, you, know, with you know, it was Huerta de Ser Si Se Puede. And, uh, and uh, uh, I ended up uh, with her in mind, with Cise Puede. Why? Because we were able to uh, accomplish legislative initiatives without a single representative in the uh, Wisconsin legislature. And Cesar Chavez, uh, again, uh, with Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, they wanted a, a labor uh, act or a labor law that would mediate uh, the differences that they had with, at that time with the great gores and now that they have uh, across the board and they eventually uh, they eventually got it so uh, 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 those uh, those things are still at the fore we when i was a member of the board of regents i passed a resolution allowing for uh, chancellors to give uh, children of undocumented workers who qualified uh, 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 for uh, for residency uh, in state tuition. Uh, come uh, the Republicans uh, uh, led by uh, Governor Walker, he rescinds. We we're the only one of two states that rescinded a, uh, a law to protect uh, 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 in state tuition for, uh, for our youngsters uh, in, the, in the United States. So the, that legislative initiative is important. It's important for the future of our children. It's important for our community. The same thing as driver's licenses. It's just ridiculous. 
that uh, that uh, it's just so unjust that we don't have access. Uh, everybody should have uh, uh, to pass an exam. In other words, it's safety. It's about safety. It's not just about the right to work uh, and having the opportunity to drive a vehicle to and from work, but it's also about safety and passing an exam. So those are the kinds of challenges that we have that are at the, at the uh, forefront of what needs to be uh, what needs to be done. The other thing is that in our neighborhoods we have to have access to owner home ownership. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, the undocumented could get home loans. We need to get back into that. We can't allow El Barrio to be just dominated by uh, absentee landlords. We have to have the opportunity for our families. If we want a safe and secure neighborhood, we have to give our families the right to own those uh, neighborhoods, to have a say into how the, the peace and security of those neighborhoods. Thank you so much, Jesus. I think I speak for everyone here when I say I'm feeling very inspired and feel that I, I now can take some action. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. You are taking the action very day. I know who you are. So congratulations <laughs> to you. Success.